it's it's a very international uh, collaboration that we have um, because we are actually got various locations of where people are sat. So I would like to introduce my co-host Sven, who's uh, putting the slides uh, advancing. Uh, Sven is currently in Texas in the USA. The research team that um, sort of underpinned today's uh, webinar stem from Jordan Fenton that you can see on the left of this slide, through to myself, James King, uh, Sven, Claire Madigan, Henrietta, Graham, uh, Tash, Kirk and Carolyn Mason. We represent not only Loughborough University, but we are also collaborating with the Sheffield Teaching Hospital, of which you will have the pleasure of hearing uh, the implications of the findings and some of the qualitative results around weight management for persons with spinal cord injury uh, from Carolyn's expertise as being a dietitian in the care of spinal cord injury at a rehabilitation level. More so, this uh, particular uh, project has been sponsored and funded by the National Institute for Health and Care Research through a collaboration uh, to further knowledge and translate what is known around weight management to people that work in this area. And I'd like to recognise the support of MASCIP, for which we have won uh, the Best Poster Award last year presenting this work, but more so for their forum to enable us to further the knowledge in this particular area from a pre previous working group that did actually forge the way forward doing this type of work. And we'd like to work with MASCIP and others in the UK to obviously translate this information and really make it user friendly, useful in the community for daily practice around weight management strategies. So, again, I'm now going to pass over to Sven and the other team to talk more around the systematic review, where it came from, the background, methods and results. And then I would like to open the floor to questions from the audience. Um, to discuss ways forward and again to have further discussion around this very topical uh, area of, of sort of research at this moment in time. Thanks very much Sven and hopefully the, we have no more technical hiccups. <laughs> yeah. uh, well we got one. I Somehow this <laughs> changing of the slides is just a nightmare. Um, okay well I'll I'll start talking and try to get the slides up in the meanwhile. Um, sorry for that slow, slow start. We can always ask Henrietta to try her her tools, and you can just go next slide if uh, if needed. Do you want to give that a try, Henrietta? Yeah. Do you want me to share my screen and then press next slide? Yeah, if you want to. This is a, a sign of us getting old, I think, Vicky. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, if you start there. Yes. All right. OK, thank you. <laughs> we got that. Um, so yeah, we're talking uh, today about yeah, weight loss and, and weight management uh, in, in spinal cord injury. So I think it's good to start off with uh, just a, a definition of, of obesity. Um, and I appreciate that this is quite uh, the mouthful uh, this definition but i think the main thing to take away at this moment about this definition is that it's more and more seen as a disease rather than traditionally seen as like a, a lack of willpower for example but it's really um, more and more also by medical associations seen as a disease obesity that then has an impact on can you click uh, Henrietta? um that then has an impact on um, well, on, on chronic disease, on uh, mobility, on function. It doesn't work for you either? Yeah, I just want that image up. Slide, slide three.
Well, let let me give it a try. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Good. Um, so this kind of gives a, a comprehensive uh, overview of both the risk factors for obesity um, for this disease then and for the consequences. Um, and this is a study by by Gary Farkas at all that uh, showed that nicely. And um, we go like in the next few slides, we go more into detail on the risk factors and why potentially people with spinal cord injury seem to be at an elevated risk for, for obesity and, and uh, the consequences. Um, but from this slide, from this image, I want you to yeah, really appreciate how much of an impact uh, obesity can have on, on a variety of chronic disease. Um, so it's cardiovascular disease, um, endocrine disorders like diabetes in particular, but then also more and more we we start to realize how it impacts on on cognitive function on maybe Alzheimer's risk. Um, so it's really something that that matters a lot uh, and potentially even more in in the spinal cord injury population that we work with um, compared to the, the able-bodied population. Next slide, please. Yes. So here's some examples of of why it seems that spinal cord injury uh, or people with spinal cord injury are maybe at an elevated risk uh, compared to able-bodied individuals when it comes to the consequences of obesity. Um, so first of all, using those cutoffs, so BMI cutoffs for people with spinal cord injury, which tends to be uh, 22, a BMI of 22 and higher, um, using those cutoffs, it seems or it is estimated that uh, around 70% of people with SCI actually have overweight or obesity. Um, and then going forward, like looking at those large cohort studies, these large population studies, um, it seems that people with spinal cord injury are at a two to three times higher risk for diabetes, cardiovascular disease, uh, compared to the background general population. You can see that, for example, here in that uh, the figure, the study by Craig et al. Uh, here they used um, a Canadian health survey where they surveyed 60,000 people. And basically within that survey, they, they compared to people with SCI compared to the, the background population. Um, and there you see like overall over the lifetime. People have a two to three times higher risk um, compared to the able bodied individuals. And you see here especially I think what stands out for me, if you look at that graph is, is at that uh, middle aged uh, time period. So between 45, 49, that's, uh, that's a, a huge difference there between the two populations. Um, and the same is, so we recently, um, actually today we got a, a study accepted in spinal cord where we also um, tracked this, like the, the risk for diabetes in people with SCI. So we had a cohort uh, in the VA, so veterans, and that we followed for up to 21 years. Uh, and that we also found a two to three times higher risk of diabetes compared to the background population. Um, and another thing that's important, so yes, there's this increased risk uh, for chronic disease, which is potentially related to obesity. But of course, obesity has an impact on, on many more things, like you think about uh, only just transferring from your wheelchair to the bed or, or wherever, like mobility is also impacted by obesity. So all in all, uh, it's, a, it's a problem uh, and an issue that, that's really worth considering, both inpatient phase, my clinical, as well as uh, over the lifespan. Uh, next slide, please. And yeah, there are factors like, as I said before, like obesity is really considered as a, as a disease and there are many factors that play into it uh, in terms of psychological, physiological, uh, environmental. Um, but under the line, it's, it's still mainly a question of energy balance. Um, and there are several factors of spinal cord injury that impact on this energy balance. So we can see, for example, on the left, when we look at energy expenditure, so that side of the balance, uh, we know that because of the paralysis, there's this large reduction in muscle mass, uh, which then has a knock-on effect on um, a reduced metabolic rate as well. Um, and I'll show some examples of that later. But if you measure resting metabolic rate, just at rest, uh, there is a, a large reduction of that in spinal cord injury compared to uh, able-bodied controls. And at the same time, if you look at the other side of the balance, so energy intake or energy conservation, there's also factors related to SCI that, that impact uh, on that side of the balance. 
Um, so, for example, um, sympathetic dysfunction might have an impact on on appetite regulation. That is something that is now sort of increasingly being studied. So, how well um, does the brain interact with the gut? How how do these signals from, for example, gut hormones? How do they uh, impact on the brain and on satiety and satiation in people with with spinal cord injury? And does that maybe have an impact? on the way people match their energy intake with the energy expenditure. Uh, next slide, please. And I show you yeah, some examples of the factors in spinal cord injury that impact on, on that energy balance. Uh, can you click on it? Um, so for, yes, perfect. <laughs> that makes it easy. Um, yeah, so for example, I mentioned this, this muscle mass, like especially in the first months after injury, there's a large reduction of, of muscle mass, especially, of course, in the lower limbs. Um, up to 55% has been reported in uh, in earlier studies. And and muscle mass is, is a major driver for energy expenditure at, at rest. Um, and you see that, for example, in the study of uh, Buchholz in, in the early 2000s, where they also saw like between 40 and 27% reduction in that rest, resting metabolic rate. Um, so how that's measured is that you, you people lie on a bed really at rest and uh, with an online respirometry that uh, the energy expenditure is measured normally for about half an hour. Um, so we can say something about yeah the, the basal metabolic rate or resting metabolic rate. Um, and that comprises a large part of daily energy expenditure. But of course, also physical activity is something that uh, contributes to that energy expenditure. And we know from uh, studies, observational studies, where people have uh, had a tracker on their wheelchair or on their body, on their wrist, for example. And when we track that physical activity, we see also there that uh, people with SCI are, um, well, for example, a 40% reduction in that physical activity uh, was found in uh, in a Dutch study in 2010. Um, so yeah, all in all, there's, there's a lot of factors, physiological factors that impact on, on that energy balance. Um, but then there's also just in society, there's barriers to, to exercise, to engage in physical activity. So a lot of barriers to, to have an increased energy expenditure. Um, and at the same time, when it comes to the, the energy intake side of things there are also i think still perceived barriers or actual barriers in this population as it comes to for example knowledge um on on dietary approaches and, and a lack of real guidelines um as to caloric intake for example but also other factors of, of nutrition uh, next slide and that that translates to the to the clinic as well. Um, so there's very little evidence. So I give you a, a little teaser, and then and later on we'll um, we'll discuss what we find in this review. But for example, here in in spinal cord injury uh, hospitals or, or centres in in the UK, we see the number of dietitians or the number of beds per dietitian. Uh, and I want you to focus there on that uh, on that row indeed uh, with dietitian, and then the national average. So there's almost 100 beds per dietitian, and that compares to the national standard, which is uh, 60. That's kind of the recommendation, the number of beds per uh, per dietitian or per full-time dietitian. Um, so that's clearly an, an under-staffing uh, uh, going on there in, in even the clinical settings. And then can you click on it? And then when we look here um, at the, the American situation, so this is a study that have uh, surveyed um, physicians, both from VA institutions, but also non-VA institutions. And they, they looked at how or they asked in what way the physicians screen for, for chronic disease and cardiometabolic uh, yeah, disease. What time do they do that and, and what do they screen for? And I think some of the, the main takeaways or the, the, yeah, the striking things like one thing that the physicians reported um, is that they, uh, so 62 percent of them, they reported that they perceived a lack of training and a lack of knowledge as a result on cardiometabolic health, cardiometabolic screening, and then also interventions to, to, uh, to tackle that. Um, and at the same time, when you look at screening for insulin resistance, 
um, so diabetes risk uh, and lipid dysregulation, so cardiovascular disease risk. Um, uh, only 29% of the, the whole group, so people with formal and no formal training, they screened for insulin resistance, so not even a third of them, um, and, and not even half of, of uh, the, the, the people working in these clinical institutions screened for, for lipids. So it seems that there's, um, yeah, potentially less attention than ideal to this issue, um, which might relate to the, yeah, to the, I think still a slight lack of that knowledge base that is out there when it comes to nutrition, obesity, weight management, and uh, chronic disease. Uh, can you do the next slide, Tanya? And to kind of get an idea of, of what it could look like or, or um, what is out there for the general population and how that also could be of use for, for spinal cord injury. Um, I'll give you a, a brief overview um, of, the, of the systems that are in place in the UK. And I should mention that, that these slides are um, put together by, by James King. So yeah, thank him for that. And there's a tiered system in the UK. The NHS used that, uh, uses uh, a tiered system. So tier one uh, is really quite uh, informal. It's kind of in, in the uh, interactions with the GP. You might get a flyer or you refer to a, a certain website. Um, for example, um, there's a, a system uh, that, that encourages moving and physical activity. And it's got a website uh, and it's got different resources on that website. So GPs can, as part of their prescription can refer patients to their website. So that's kind of hands off, uh, an hands off approach, um, but that's that's a tier one uh, level. Then if you move to tier two, um, that's already a little bit more intense and is uh, yeah, lifestyle, behavior change, weight management services that are often um, performed by, by companies. So it's kind of outsourced by the NHS to specific uh, companies, and I'll show you um, a study of those interventions in a, in a minute. But then, when people have more, um, yeah, higher uh, BMIs combined with uh, one or more comorbidities, like for example diabetes, there's a more intense approach, and that's that tier three, which is really a, a multidisciplinary approach where you have dietitians, you have psychologists, you have behavior change um, people, um, and also like exercise physiologists and people who uh, work on that exercise part of the, the the approach, and this is also the the tier where it's it's more common to include uh, um, pharma pharmaceuticals. Um, so I'm sure you've heard more and more about the the obesity drugs, and that's something that could come in into that tier three as well. And then when you move up to even more severe obesity, um, also with comorbidities, then surgery is uh, is an option within the NHS system. Uh, next slide, please. And yeah, this is that um, yeah NHS weight management program. So it's a tier two intervention uh, that I mentioned. Um, can you do the next slide, uh, Hanya? And yeah, this is part of the tier two, as I said, and there's a study that is, I think, worth looking at um, by Norik that compared different tier two approaches within the NHS system. And they took over 500 people and they randomized it into either a control group or one of the three interventions that you see here. So you have this NHS weight loss plan, which is freely accessible for everyone. Um, and then there's two weight loss uh, plans that, are, that that require a prescription and that have like a bit of interaction with uh, um, uh, a dietitian and have resources online. And this was followed for eight weeks, eight weeks, all interventions were followed for eight weeks. And as you can see here from, from the numbers here, so that the weight loss that was achieved, also here, even in able-bodied individuals, it's not necessarily uh, changing people's lives, right? So uh, a weight loss of 0.4 kilo on average, that's not considered clinically meaningful. Uh, and also, if you look at the figure, I appreciate it's, it's slightly small, but this tells us what percentage of, of people, of, of participants, achieved a 5% weight loss or more. And they used 5% um, because that's seen as 
clinically meaningful. So there we see improvements in glucose tolerance uh, and in cardiovascular disease uh, risk factors uh, like lipids, for example. And we see here, like even in the best intervention, so that was that uh, Rosemary online, it's not even 20% of the people that reaches that clinically meaningful change. Um, so that's in able-bodied individuals who are able to, to exercise and expend a lot of energy by, by that exercise. So it tells us that, yeah, especially then maybe for spinal cord injury, that that's maybe not necessarily too hopeful for uh, these kind of behavior change interventions. Um, can you do the next slide, Henry? Um, and then, yeah, it looks already a bit more promising when you look at the tier three uh, kind of interventions. So here, uh, this is this more intense intervention with more contact uh, with a dietitian, more frequent uh, contact points, uh, either face to face, by phone, um, or using an app. And here, yeah, again, I want you to focus on this this figure. And in black, so the black bar shows the percentage of people that has that five percent weight loss or more. And and there it's already better, like almost half of the people reach that reach that point. So that's that's more more promising uh, from that perspective. Okay, put the next next slide. But then what is um yeah, what gains more and more traction and it's as I said, it can be part of that tier three approach are these um obesity drugs. So there's incretine based drugs that um either have analogs for GLP-1 or GLP-1 with GIP, or now there's also these they call triple agonists, so it's GLP-1, GIP, um, and glucagon. And here on the left is one of the first studies that looked at this. Um, so this is uh, using semaglutide, which is GLP-1 um, uh, analog, uh, compared to a to a placebo control group. And you see here. Like in the in the previous tiers, we saw a weight loss of like one to five percent uh, on average. Whilst here, if you subtract it from the placebo group, is more towards fifteen percent. So that might change a lot uh, in in the sort of weight management field. And then at the same time, I showed that tier four, that is the the surgery solution, and and that appears on average to have an effect of between twenty and thirty percent of of weight loss. You do the next slide, Henry. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I, I made it late. Yeah. So in all in all, um this kind of shows you an overview of, of what is done for the general population in the UK. And the main reason for us how why why to do this review um is that we we are aware that the, the services and the, the guidelines and the, the knowledge available for, for people with SCI but also for healthcare practitioners is still very limited. So we really wanted to synthesize and appraise the literature that is out there now um, to either work eventually towards guidelines or to, to really have a better idea of, of where are the gaps and what is still needed in this area. Uh, so how we did it I want to pass on to Henriette. You're on mute, Jill. Okay, can people hear and see me now? Yeah, I'm just going to guess that everyone can hear me. Yeah, um, yeah, we can hear you, Henry. Okay, yes, good. Um, thank you, Sven. Uh, my name is Henrietta Graham. I'm a behavioural weight management research associate working within Loughborough University. And as uh, Sven said, I'm going to take you through a very brief description of the methodology that we used um, for this systematic review. Um, so just to explain maybe to those people who aren't from a research background what exactly a systematic review is, so it's essentially a study where we combine together all the results of other studies in order to answer a specific research question. And in our case, we use the systematic review to examine the evidence related to weight management in people with spinal cord injury. Um, and so one of the first steps that we do when we're conducting a systematic review is that we develop inclusion exclusion criteria. 
And so this is basically a list that we develop that helps us understand whether studies, uh, which studies will be helpful in us answering our research question. So as a team, we developed this inclusion exclusion criteria. I'm just going to really briefly run through the inclusion criteria. And if you have any other questions about this, feel free to ask me afterwards. Um, so studies that were included that we felt would help us answer our research questions were studies that tested uh, weight loss or weight gain prevention intervention in adults with traumatic and non-traumatic spinal cord injury. And uh, we had more specific criteria in that if uh, the weight gain prevention interventions um, were only eligible for inclusion if they included participants with acute spinal cord injury. And then for the weight loss interventions, these type of interventions were only included if they recruited um, participants with chronic spinal cord uh, injury. The interventions had to be conducted in primary care and then delivered by a staff member from primary care. But we were quite um, we didn't have any specific criteria about who exactly had to deliver the intervention within the primary care setting. So it could be delivered by physicians or nurses, for example. And we also didn't have specific criteria about the method of delivery. So the intervention could have been delivered via face to face uh, contact or via telephone. The only sort of criteria that we did have in terms of the intervention was that it had to be longer than four weeks in duration and it couldn't involve weight loss supplements or alternative or complementary therapies. Um, the studies were included and relevant to our review if they tested the effect of the intervention that I just described on weight outcomes. So uh, specifically, um, or for example, kg and pounds. But uh, they also had to compare the effect of the intervention to another non weight management related group. So this might have been groups that didn't receive any treatment at all or received minimal intervention, uh, minimal intervention. Um, again, just feel free to ask me any questions about this criteria afterwards. So using this, oh, actually, I should add as well that we also included qualitative studies. So this is very much the criteria that we used for including and deciding whether quantitative studies might be relevant. But we also included um, qualitative studies. So we include qualitative studies that involved um, healthcare professionals working with spinal cord injury in the, in the area of spinal cord injury, as well as caregivers and anybody else involved in weight management uh, related to spinal cord injury. And this is just so that we could get a better understanding of the experience of weight management um, related to spinal cord injury. So based on this inclusion exclusion criteria, we then developed our search strategy, which looks a bit like this. And uh, it's a very complicated um, text, but basically it's just what we use to search our research databases. So this is the search strategy that we developed for Medline, but we adapted this for the four other databases that we searched to find potentially relevant studies. Um, so we applied this and uh, we adopted this um, search strategy and applied it to uh, Embase, Sports Discus, Scopus, as well as Central. So we actually searched five databases in total and we also included an update review, um, sorry, search uh, about six months before we, we uh, sent this paper in to be peer reviewed. So once we completed our search strategy and did our searches, we ended up with, um, this is very normal in systematic reviews to have thousands of potentially relevant studies. But obviously, we can't include all of these in the systematic review and, and a lot of them aren't even relevant anyway. So we carry out a process whereby we screen the studies against the inclusion exclusion criteria to determine which ones are actually relevant to our research question. So we did this and um, we did this first by screening the title and abstracts of the studies and then determining whether they were relevant or not. And then any studies that we hadn't excluded, we and thought maybe were relevant. We then um, read the full text of these studies. And after this process, we would then have the studies that we felt were relevant for this review based on our inclusion exclusion criteria. Um, the next step was then to extract the data that we had that was relevant to the primary outcome, which was a change in body weight from uh, baseline to program end, which is the primary outcome that we specified in our protocol for this review. Um, and this data was extracted and then we use this data to manually calculate the overall mean difference across studies in weight from pre to post intervention in order to kind of find out the effect that these interventions were having in terms of weight. 
We also extracted data relevant to our qualitative data outcome, which was the perceptions, attitudes and personal experiences of weight management from patients, healthcare professionals and caregivers. And um, that's a mouthful. But um, yes, we extracted data relevant to this outcome as well. And then we analysed this data using thematic analysis which is a way of analysing the data where we look at the experiences of people um, who have experienced weight management and spinal cord injury. And then we look for themes within their um, what they're telling us. And then we use these to answer the research question. Um, and we did this. We did thematic analysis within a software known as NVivo, which is a qualitative tool that we can use. And then finally, we checked the quality of the data that we had or the studies that were included in our review. So this is really important because it helps us to um, sort of decide what kind of conclusions we can make about the uh, data that we have, the, the findings that we have, because it could be that a lot of the studies that were included in our review are of low quality or it could be that they were very high quality. So assessing actually the quality of the studies included in our review was really important. And so we used a range of different tools to do this. So we used the risk of bias tool, which was used to assess the quality in randomized control trials that were included in our review. We used the Robbins tool for non-randomized control trials. And then we used the CASP checklist, um, which was used to assess the quality of the qualitative data that was included in our reviews. So, yeah, just very quick whistle stop tour of the methodology, but I'm happy to answer any questions um, after the seminar is over. I'm going to pass over to Carolyn now, I think, to discuss the results. I'll move on the slides, Carolyn. I, uh, I'll go first, if that's okay. Okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Carolyn. Um, um, yeah, as, as Henriette uh, said, like this is yeah, the process of extracting the data and really using our inclusion exclusion criteria to uh yeah to come up with our final set of studies that we uh that we reviewed and um yeah later on in in once the publication is out hopefully i'll, I'll let you have a look at it in more detail uh, by reading it but the main thing to take away here is that we in included in the end 22 22 studies as you can see at the bottom of the uh, of the slide and that was a mix, as Henrietta said, a mix between quantitative studies uh, as well as qualitative studies. So the quanti quantitative studies looked at really the effect of this intervention on weight loss, pre versus post, um, and qualitative was around perceptions and attitudes. We do next slide. Um, so before going to to the weight loss and really uh, yeah the numbers that we were interested in, uh, I want you to give a, a feel for what these studies look like. Um, so what what kind of studies did we include? So when we look at the quantitative studies, um, there were three RCTs uh, and eight pre post studies. So an RCT is really people were randomized into with these studies, in that case, two groups, so either a control group where people just in these studies went about their, their normal life and they just only did the pre and post testing. Um, and the intervention group was, um, yeah, the intervention itself and people were randomized into to those groups. Whilst the pre post studies was really just one group of people who all went through the same intervention. And then the, the test or the main outcome was the, the weight pre versus post. So when you look at kind of what kind of confidence we can give those kind of findings and those results, uh, an RCT, so a randomized control trial, is always uh, above, like has more weight when it comes to interpreting the findings compared to a, a pre to post study. Um, so that's something to keep in mind, I think. Um, and to give a, yeah, an idea about these RCTs, so there are three in total, so two of them were more like a behavior change intervention versus a control. Um, so it was six to seven months and where people received uh, once weekly uh, interaction like, a, like an educational session about nutrition, physical activity at this energy balance. And the control groups uh, just went about their, their normal life. Um, was the third RCT that was a small scale study um, that was looking at this semaglutide, so this obesity drug. Uh, so it's three versus two, so it's more like a pilot kind of study, but they followed people for six months and then looked at yeah people who received semaglutide and still at the doses that is, that is um, prescribed for diabetes, so slightly lower 
than the obesity prescription. They looked at that group versus a, a control group. Um, and if we look at all study participants overall and, and the people with SCI uh, in first instance, we um, all the studies uh, yeah, recruited or included 347 persons with SCI, uh, a BMI of almost 33. And the age, um, yeah, it was on average 50 and with, with quite a large range, as you see, but, but on the, the higher end of, of middle age. And then these qualitative studies, um, yeah, also ask for the perceptions and attitudes of healthcare practitioners, so people who, uh, yeah, who had to prescribe weight loss intervention, had to work, uh, or had to manage uh, the weight management in, uh, in this population. Um, and they were mostly female, as you can see. Um, and also quite a, a large range of, of ages. And when we then continue with the, the intervention characteristics at the bottom, um, in general, you can see that it's, it's, it's fairly, they are fairly small studies in comparison to what we know from the able-bodied literature. So, for example, when I earlier described us that tier system and the interventions in tier two, for example, that were studies that have hundreds of people per arm was here um, and yeah I'm sure many of you are aware of that because of the, the difficulties with uh, recruitment uh, other um, barriers that that uh, that are out there for for doing this kind of studies the numbers are a lot lower at this uh, moment in time yeah. so on average 16 participants in these studies and the intervention duration so we as Henrietta said we we used a cutoff for four weeks of minimum but actually the, the range is from 12 weeks to 52 weeks with an average of 14 weeks. So in that sense, it, uh, yeah, it was promising duration. To do the next slide. Yes. Um, so these are the, the, the primary outcomes. And indeed the, the, the main outcome here is uh, that weight loss. And here we split it up between the RCT, so there's randomized controlled trials, those three studies, uh, and the pre-post studies, where it's just one group going through the same intervention. And, and this is in percentage, so not kilograms, this is in percentage where this 5% is seen as clinically meaningful. And we see that RCTs, on average, have a percentage uh, reduction in weight of 3.6%. And that is kind of similar if we look at those pre-post studies, so there's 4% 4, 4 weight loss. So, yeah, the promising news with that is that, yes, these interventions also in people with spinal cord disease, we can actually induce weight loss, weight loss in, uh, in this population. What is, in our eyes, like less, um, yeah, less positive news is, is the fact that if we look at that 5%, this clinically meaningful weight loss, is that only about a third of people actually achieved that, uh, that amount of weight loss. Plus, again, like there's studies, more more intense studies that have been done in the, the general population that can be up to to 60 percent. And so that is, I think, something that also when uh, Carolyn will look at the implications later, that is something that uh, that will come up in our considerations. Um, and I'm moving on. Yeah, with BMI and body fat percentage, we also see again that kind of moderate uh, effects can be achieved or are achieved um, in, in the literature this far. So 1.6 uh, reduction in BMI and uh, about a 3% reduction in, in body fat percent. You do the next slide, Henry. Yes. And these are some yeah, additional observations that we saw when we tried to look a bit more closely at our, uh, at our findings. So one thing that we did, for example, is to explore whether there was um, whether there were some associations between the subject or the participant characteristics and the effects of the intervention. So if you look at that, that figure, we actually found that there was indeed a relationship between the starting BMI and then the weight loss that was achieved in, in the intervention. And we see here on the, yeah, the y-axis is the weight loss x-axis BMI. So you can see that the higher the BMI at the start, the more effective the intervention seems to be. And yeah, we appreciate that, like this is not many studies and, and this this study there, that point there on the, on the right might have had a, a large effect on that, that correlation. But still, there might be, um, yeah, something going on there. And another observation that we 
yeah, we think would be important to take away for future studies is the fact that uh, the interventions, and these are pre post studies that seem to be most effective, they included uh, three components. So it's specific caloric intake goals, um, behavior change techniques, and a, a focus and recommendation on, on physical activity. Um, so, for example, in uh, a study by Brocchetti et al. in uh, 2020, they found that 15 of the 18 participants that underwent uh, their, their behavior change or their, their intervention, they achieved that weight loss of 5% or more. So it seems, and that's also uh, found in able-bodied studies, that these three components um, are important to include um, if you go uh, through this route. Can you do the next slide? Yes, so then I pass over to Heather <laughs> Carolyn. So thank you. And um, so I'm Carolyn Taylor. I am the uh, dietitian at the Spinal Injuries Unit in Sheffield. And um, I'm just going to go through the qualitative synthesis that um, we did as part of the study. And then, um, as has been indicated, sort of start thinking about what does this mean for clinical practice? So the Qualitative synthesis, um, as Henrietta says, is done as a um, with cinematic analysis. And with that, we developed um, there were three themes that came out. Um, and uh, the one you can see now is the is the first theme um, that was looking at some of the um, health professionals um, views as to um, their experiences with uh, supporting people through weight management. And uh, the sort of two main sort of sub themes that came out of that was that the um, weight loss that they were um, that the obesity is thought to be burdensome to just some of them, and they don't actually know whether um, there was sort of a split between those that said yes, we need to address it, and those that actually said no, they've actually patients that have been injured need to um, actually. Um, pause a bit and actually address all the other implications that they're having within their um, the life changes that they're experiencing. So that was really sort of the there was two, two sort of um, opposing poles really within that, that actually they need to address it, but actually it might not be the right time to address it. Um, so if we can have the next slide, please, Henrietta. The um, second um, theme um, also uh, looked at this, I uh, sort of looked at how the patients and the healthcare sort of interacted a little bit. And actually, one of the interesting things for me as a, a dietitian, when you kind of think, well, we can just weigh our patients within the units, that actually um, the health professionals were saying this is actually quite difficult because even when they're coming to the clinic, that actually getting people off their wheelchairs, in and out of their wheelchairs can actually be quite problematical and resource intensive. Um, they also suggested that, yes, obesity is a problem, um, um, but it, and, and is, as we've discussed already, is impacting on quality of life and their barriers to health. But that actually um, we, we need to think a little bit more about how we can actually recognise the obesity um, that's happening within the uh, patient population. The last one was um, the caregivers. And again, if you think about those that are um, looking after our patients, some of the um, analysis that we were coming up with uh, that was coming out from the literature was that, um, again, with a little bit like the healthcare professionals, there were sort of a, a polar opposites in that some were saying, yeah, it's really great to be supporting people through their um, weight change. But actually, some of them were saying this is just another problem that we're having to address with all the other problems that we're we're facing with our patients. And actually, the the other thing was we need to include that the caregivers need to be included in this weight management intervention. It's not they're the ones that are likely to be doing the uh, food preparations and also providing the transport to, you know, to activities and all those other kind of um, elements that supports weight management for our population. So um, can I have the next slide, please, Henrietta? So really, that, that sort of summary was that 
We kind of know as healthcare professionals, and this is what's coming out in the literature, we know that obesity is a problem, but actually is it the priority at the time when we're seeing them when they're first injured, when they've got the most intensive um, intervention happening? Is it is it right to be talking about it now when they're having to address all the other practical changes that they're having following their injury? But there's a recognition that if we don't get on top of that, that actually it's going to impact on their long term health and that we that that, that kind of needs to move forward. Um, and we actually measuring our patients becomes a little bit more practically difficult. Patients can't necessarily do this in their own home. Um, they may not have facilities locally. So actually, can we bring do them at the um, at clinics when they're coming for their other outpatient appointments? But actually, the, the information we were getting from the, um, the literature was that actually in a busy clinic, getting the staff available to help them move the um, patient out of their wheelchair to then weigh the wheelchair separately was a potential problem and a barrier to actually doing this within their um, own um, within our own clinic and our specialty, you know, the, the, the specialist centres that we have. Um, and one of the other factors was we need to think about how do we involve the caregiver in this as well, um, in that it's not just to um, the patient that we should be providing their intervention, but actually the, the caregiver needs to be um, on board with this. Um, as well, um, as the literature was saying, some of them feel that it's a burden because it's something else they have to address. But actually, we need to now think about, well, how do we incorporate that um, moving forward? So that's sort of the summary for what we got from the qualitative synthesis. Can I have the next slide, please? So what does that mean? As, as, as I said, as I introduced myself, I'm a dietitian. I work at the a Spinal Centre. And um, how do I think about this with, with what we, we've learned throughout this systematic review. Um, as Fen was saying, we can, with the relevant um, evidence and with the relevant intervention and the evidence supports that we may be able to produce clinically relevant weight loss, but that it's hard. Um, but we also need to make sure that we're incorporating uh, those three elements of the education with the calorie, behavioural change and the physical activity. We also need to think about the caregiver within that. Um, the prevalence of obesity, it seems to be getting more. Um, and actually, um, my challenge to my own clinical team is maybe we have to move this to a higher priority within the healthcare um, that we're providing, because we're knowing and from the literature, um, we know that it's impacting on long term health. Um, so maybe we need to shift some of the priority to actually focusing on this. And we also, within that cultural shift, need to really think about when is the right time to start this. So right at the beginning, we were talking about weight prevention or weight management. Is that what we should be doing? And when's the right time to actually um, sensitively talk to our patients about the um, implications moving forward for their weight management? OK, next slide. And I think I'm going to hand over to, am I handing over to anybody else to do some closing thoughts or do you want me to do the closing thoughts? Happy either way. I can do the closing thoughts. You can keep um, going, Carolyn. <laughs> OK, thanks. Um, so um, there are the increased risks associated with obesity. And I think um, what we need to think about is what are the secondary complications, the obesity, the diabetes, the coronary heart disease, all those other con complications moving forward. It is a high priority. It's a high priority for us. That's why we did the systematic review to find out what the evidence was there at the beginning. There are barriers to weight management, um, as Sven um, highlighted, even with the able-bodied population or the general population, there are barriers. We have a unique um, additional barriers to supporting our patients to have a healthier lifestyle with both the diet and the physical activity. OK. We can, as I've said, um, as we've said along the way, um, produce a meaningful weight loss, 
but only a third of those involved in the um, clinical studies were able to um, to obtain that. However, um, compared to the able-bodied, where it is, it is a higher percentage. We need to think carefully about how do we manage our patients, how do we monitor our patients in the practical world, and and that's where um, I think we need to all think about it um, and moving forward um, from from our point of view. Um, I think that is um, important. We've got the next slide, I think. And yeah. uh, these are the next steps. I'm going to hand back to Vicky for this one, I think. <laughs> me, me and Sven, but I think you, you actually appear on this really, uh, Carolyn, of almost us just highlighting you know, we, we want to open up the floor to discussion in a moment and appreciate that we've perhaps gone to time. But whilst we have the expert, experts here on the call, then please feel free for five minutes to hang on. Um, but, you know, here at Loughborough, we have done work around appetite regulation. Um, you know, we, we're aware around the sort of the need to focus around understanding energy expenditure. We're aware that there are the sort of pharmaceutical ways around weight management and can they be utilised safely within persons with spinal cord injury. But most importantly, I guess, where Carolyn comes together and really where this whole project comes together is more around the fact that we want a tailored service provision within NHS, um, industry partners, academics. We've shown that we, we work collectively with Carolyn and her team and we really want to work together on the next steps around the next PhD students, which is someone like Carolyn herself, uh, who's been successful with a fellowship to, to do that, whilst retaining sort of the clinical status. Um, and really anyone on the call here, I just really want to be saying if anyone's interested in the work that the team have uh, have presented, it'd be wonderful to hear more from you. Uh, Sven uh, was at Loughborough University and he's now in Texas. And again, there's different systems of healthcare in different countries. So if there are people internationally on this call and would like to collaborate and, and think about moving this this area forward, it'll be wonderful to hear more more from you.